anyway, the, the, the first thing I, I want to talk about before I really get into what's behind me here in Jamestown, uh, and talk to Anthony later, he told me how he would attack Jamestown, that'll be interesting to hear a little bit later, but is that uh, when we talk about history, we, we have to first off talk about what is history. History is not the past. I know that sounds shocking to people. History is writing about the past. The past is the past. History is writing about the past. And that as historians, uh, we look at the past and try to interpret the past. Um, and those interpretations change all the time. Uh, and that's why when I say all history is revisionist history, when somebody tells me, hey, that's revisionist history, well, all history is that way, because much like any other uh, academic field, that when you get new information, uh, you may come at it at a different approach. And so you've seen, like recently, there was an article, I think it was written in today's paper, that the Trump administration wants to defund schools that use the 1619 Project out of the New York Times as, as part of its course materials. Well, the 1619 Project, for those of you who don't know, and we're going to talk about 1619, very important year for uh, Jamestown, uh, looks at the history of America through slavery. Um, and it's a bunch of different writers, and some argue that, uh, that, that slavery was the reason for the founding of the country, that the, the Constitution was created to maintain slavery. That's an interpretation. Uh, we'll talk about, probably in, in the spring, about, uh, well, probably about in, actually not the spring, probably in October, about a historian in the 1890s, Charles Beard, who had an interpretation of the Constitutional Convention, was that these were just rich men trying to protect their own wealth. They had no interest in democracy. And so history is writing about the past, but through all different lenses, different interpretations. Uh, and some are more valid than others, some are more accepted than others, but you can take history uh, either from a, socialist pers a social perspective, uh, the lives of everyday people, uh, it, it can be from a political perspective, it can be from an economic perspective, um, it can be from the per, uh, perspective of oppressed groups. And all of those together really give us a, a general sense of, of what history is going to be. So when we look at some of these things, uh, don't automatically judge by that, or set, that, that methodology that they're using, that lens they're looking through. Because we'll, we'll hit a little bit of all of those lenses here. We're going to see that economics is important. We're going to see slavery is a driving force in the first half of this course, uh, and then that changing to more of a civil rights as a, as a driving force. We're going to look at labor unions. We're going to look at immigration. We're going to look at uh, the big robber barons, the great political leaders, and all of those different lenses. And so when, when, we, when we start studying history, how do we do it? Well, historians do it a lot of different ways uh, right now. And, uh, I think Anthony and I were talking about this earlier, was that uh, they're using archaeological digs at Jamestown. They're digging up. If you go to Jamestown today, you can see all the archaeology going. You see, look for pieces of relics and pottery and things like that to put together the story of Jamestown. And then we also look at uh, documents, bills of sale, uh, mortgages, leases, uh, contracts, diaries, letters. And we look at all of those things to see what was really happening. And that, that, that leads us to a conundrum when we look at those kinds of things. For example, if you go back and you read uh, James Madison's diary, Madison knew that that diary was going to be used by future historians, that it was going to be read. So you can imagine that when Madison is writing this kind of diary, he wants to make himself look pretty good, right? That's the whole point. Um, and, and you see that even today. I remember uh, when Bill Clinton wrote his autobiography and he said impeachment was a badge of honor. Impeachment's never a badge of honor, but he's writing not for you or me. He's trying to write and trying to influence the future history. Uh, and so we always have to look at these kind of primary source documents and look at motivations and see if they're backed up or anything. And we're gonna see that kind of problem early on in Jamestown with Captain John Smith. So historians look at that, and they look at all this data, and they try to put it together. Often you hear people say that, well, history should just be about the facts. No. 
uh, then, then you got nothing, right? Because if we were to go look at history just as the facts, then we would say that um, in the Salem Witch Trials, uh, 19 people were hanged, the end. What does that tell us? Does it tell us what was going on in Salem, why those people were hanged? Or if we were to say 6 million Jews were killed in, in the Holocaust, what does that tell us in the long run? We should be looking at more than just what those facts are. What could have been the reasoning behind that? Why Germany? Um, why the Jews, right? So when we look at history, it's not just a matter of facts, it's trying to explain the past, why they were doing those things. And we have to sometimes speculate. Rarely do we have in writing, here's exactly what we're going to do, right? That's one of the things that's famous about Hitler is that he rarely wrote anything down, uh, knowing historically that was going to be judged against him. And so historians have that kind of, those kind of issues. And, and they're constantly looking for new information and maybe new takes. Uh, sometimes historians are out to, to make money, just like anybody else. They're gonna write a book about somebody like say, Warren G. Harding, who's listed often as one of the worst presidents. And their take is gonna be, no, he wasn't really a terrible president. He was a pretty decent president. Let's sort of uh, relook at him so you can sell something different. Um, and often historians can fall in love with their subject, whether that's a person or an event. And that can also lead to some bias. Uh, Stephen F. Ambrose, who wrote uh, a lot of great books, especially about uh, the Battle of the Bulge and, and uh, uh, World War II, I met him once. He said that he hated Richard Nixon. God, he hated Richard Nixon. And then he wrote a book about him. They didn't hate him anymore. He felt pity for him. So you've got to be careful about fawning over your subject and also being too critical of your subject, coming after your subject with an ax. Uh, so you have to try to maintain some, some sort of balance. Now, History can be a gateway into the past, but it can also bar people from the past. And that's one of the things that we're seeing now uh, in the last 30 years in history is that history has really expanded to include new groups that it didn't include before. For a long time, history was just the study of great men, right? Uh, these were predominantly white men because in Western civilization, they were in charge, right? That makes sense. But recently they go, wait, let's back it up. Let's see what, Maybe the average person was doing. Maybe your ancestor was a blacksmith in a small town. What was that person's life like? How did they live? Uh, what did they do on a daily basis? What did they believe? That history is just as important about these everyday people. Um, what, what, what was the life of a slave like? Um, what challenges did women face? So if anything, history is not getting erased. It's really just been expanded. And we're taking the people that we erased from history early on because historians felt that they didn't matter, uh, and we're putting them back in the history books. My freshman text history book, yay thick, about three inches thick. It's getting longer and longer. So we'll look at history uh, in this class, not from a uh, we hate America uh, perspective or we love America in perspective. It's going to be that we're going to see this American experiment as complicated, uh, messy, having some high ideals, uh, and often maybe not living up to those ideals. Um, but they do posit some of those ideals that become very uh, infectious, if I can use that in this COVID time period, uh, and spread around the world. When you look at the Declaration of Independence, it's been modeled by many people around the world, almost word for word. And so it's going to be a complicated view of American history, uh, good and the bad. And um, it, it probably, it, it's like any other, any other nation. You've got some good and you've got some bad. And we're going to talk about both of them. So uh, real quickly, uh, any questions about that general idea? None. Uh, there, there won't be any tests or anything like that, but I will have a link to primary source documents. Um, I've already posted that once on my Facebook page, and I have started assembling a large library of uh, primary source documents. So we'll have some on Jamestown. We'll have one on what we call the starving time. And you can read firsthand accounts of the starving time, uh, which you can imagine was not a good time in Jamestown. So saying all that, I think what we want to do tonight is that we want to at least get Jamestown founded. Now, you're probably saying, well, Brian, why aren't we starting way back to um, 25,000 years ago? when the first people came probably across the Bering Strait from Asia. 
or why are we not talking about uh, the Incas and the Aztecs, which are fascinating in their own respect? Well, I'm, I'm, ta I'm taking this approach as a United States history course, not a North American history course. And this is exactly how I would teach it in my history class. Uh, and so it gives you, I think that's the other thing I want to do here is the people don't know what's being taught in a history class, except maybe Anthony. I think Anthony Anis actually has taught in history class. Um, so what we teach is sometimes mistaken of what we do. Um, your good teachers are, are trying to maintain a good balance. But I've got these primary source documents so that if, you know, it, it per, your interest gets piqued somewhat by what I say, you can go read what some people were actually saying at the time. Uh, and, and that's always fun to do, although you can't really read the handwriting very well. You gotta get used to that. But there's always an inter uh, a type print out of it as well. So let's, let's get to business. Um, and we're going to talk about English colonization of, of North America, because that's where the United States is gonna come from. So, and, and what we'll do tonight is we'll get Jamestown set, settled uh, in that Virginia area, and we'll briefly talk about Maryland. So, English colonization is gonna begin around 1584. There's a guy named Sir Walter Raleigh, who was actually fairly friendly with the Queen of England, uh, Elizabeth I. He's later executed by uh, her successor, James I, on some trumped up charges. And Raleigh was an adventurer. He liked to travel. Um, and, and no, do not watch the Queen Elizabeth with uh, Kate Blanchett. It's completely wrong. But anyway, he's, he's thinking about, okay, look, we need to have a colony in these North American continents, maybe find gold for us. You know, because up until that point, um, the, the British, they weren't a very powerful nation. They made most of their money by, well, if you have a carjacking today, uh, boat jacking, really, they would go out there, uh, people like Francis Drake, uh, would go over to where the Spaniards were, and when they would see a ship leaving a Spanish port that was heavy in the water, they would just steal everything out of it, and then they could come back to England, right, and uh, be safe, and they'd have to pay the queen some of that money. This, of course, made the Spanish mad. Eventually, the, Span uh, the Spanish decide they're gonna go punish the English with the Spanish Armada, as you well know. It gets destroyed by a uh, storm. Uh, and that's the end of really Spanish dominance in the Atlantic after that. The English will become the more dominant sea power. Well, Raleigh decided that maybe a good place to have one would be off the coast of North Carolina, a place called Roanoke Island. Now he picks this spot because it seems like the, the, the natives are friendly. Um, he goes, all right, this seems like a good spot. They're friendly, they're not gonna kill us when we get here. So three years later, about 170, 117 colonists arrive under the leadership of John White. Now, again, here's something that we should we stop and point out when we're talking history, okay? So look at the language that we're using. When I say 117 colonists, okay, that's coming from the European point of view. If you're a Native American, do you say colonist? No, you probably don't. You probably refer to these people as invaders, right? If Martians came down and set up a settlement in Nebraska, we wouldn't call them colonists. We would say it's the Martian invaders. So this is all part of that language of history that we need to remember when we start uh, talking about history. So three years later, 117 colonists, invaders, whatever you wanna say, arrived under the leadership of a guy named John White. Now, these guys were smart, uh, they, they were. They, they brought a carpenter, they brought a blacksmith, they brought a doctor, they brought seeds so that they could uh, plant crops. So they're all well prepared, except when they first get there, the ship carrying the seed hits against the rock, salt water is thrown in there, and the seed is spoiled. Uh, and so for that first year, they're relying primarily on trade with natives. Um, so White leaves after a year, he goes, okay, I'm going back to England, um, and I'm going to get supplies. I'll be right back. Now, of course, as you can imagine, going from England back over is a long trip. And it becomes longer because he gets caught up during the Spanish Armada deal. And so he's delayed coming back. When he comes back, 
the village is gone. And this is sometimes uh, known as the lost colony of Roanoke. It's, there was a, a long article, uh, I think it was in The Economist recently, it's not really a lost colony because uh, colonies failed often. And, and probably what happened to a lot of these people because they had run out of food, the natives were trying to, tired of trading with them because they saw them as inept, they couldn't take care of themselves. What kind of people are these people? But some were probably adopted into uh, uh, native tribes, others starved to death. Um, and so that's probably what happened to the colony. They've, they've recently been digging up areas, uh, finding uh, pieces of European uh, uh, pottery, uh, cooking uh, utensils throughout the area, knowing that, okay, they, they, they were scattered out. But there's this myth of this lost colony that really starts to promulgate around the 1800s. But it's not really lost. This, this happened uh, regularly. So their first attempt was a, a complete another failure. Well, uh, in 1603, um, Elizabeth I dies. She'd been on the throne for about 44 years, a long time. Uh, she died without ever marrying. And so they had to go find somebody, and they chose James I, uh, the son of Mary, uh, Queen of Scots, who was, the reason they wanted him, he was Protestant. And he'd been the King of Scotland. Uh, and this will begin the Stuart dynasty. And it's during this, this James the First um, uh, reign that we're going to see the beginning of, of these colonies in America that really make a lasting impact. Uh, and the colonies are going to be very diverse in terms of where they're located, the motives, and who settles them. In 1606, England makes peace with Spain, finally. Um, and so this means that England no longer has to worry about uh, uh, invasion. They've got uh, ships now, and they have this new thirst for exploration and colonization. Now, how are they going to fund this? Well, the first funding is going to be from the Virginia Company. Uh, now, they call it the Virginia Company, named after Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, who never married. Um, and this is what we call a joint stock corporation. In other words, it's just like capitalism today, is that you as an investor would invest in the Virginia Company, and you would expect that the Virginia Company would uh, settle to these, these new areas. They would find gold, or they would find spices, or they'd find this myth mythical route over to uh, the East Indies, uh, the so-called Northwest Passage, which would take you all the way over to China and places like that as a shortcut. Uh, and then you would get dividends from this. Um, these people, and, and this is an interesting term, these people were known as adventure capitalists, um, that they were looking for adventure and they were capitalists. I, I mention this because today you hear the term, uh, the abbreviated term, venture capitalist. A venture capitalist is somebody who's investing in risky things. It comes from the term adventure capitalist. Uh, and so that's where it comes from. And so when you signed up to participate in this, you were hoping to get something, some re return on your investment, some gold, some wine, pitch, fruits, olive oil, you name it, timber. Uh, you hope to get some of those things. So let's talk about our first colony. And that first colony is going to be Virginia. Now, as I said, it's going to be named after Elizabeth I uh, because she never married. And on May 6, 1607, three ships loaded with about 104 men, men only, reached the Chesapeake Bay. Now, they okay, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to stay here on Chesapeake Bay because that's too close to the shoreline. And what we're going to have happen at that point is the Spanish are going to come by. They're going to kill us all and raid our town. Uh, and that'll be a disaster. So what we're going to do is there's this river over here. We're going to sail up this river uh, and we're going to call it the James River. So you can, you know, obviously um, uh, named after James the first as a way of pleasing James the first. And they're going to sail up maybe about 40 miles. They figured that's far enough to hide from Spanish pirates. Uh, it's not a good place. Uh, we were talking about this earlier this morning, mainly because where they settle at this place and they created James Fort and then later called Jamestown, uh, is it's in a swampy area. The water's brackish. It's not drinkable. 
uh, and uh, there's a lot of mosquitoes. And, and the number one killer in the history of the world has been malaria, and that's gonna be a problem. But Jamestown is gonna be the most important settlement for the future of the United States, because it's the first permanent English settlement here in the United States. Now, they weren't as smart as the Roanoke people, uh, because they came to look for gold, not to farm. They didn't know how to hunt the local game, and supplies from uh, England were unreliable. I mean, they were there just to, to, they just thought they were gonna find gold everywhere. And I know some of you have lived in Virginia, there's no gold in Virginia. And so it was gonna be tough going. So they had to develop trade with the natives, uh, and the native, was, uh, native Indians uh, were uh, Palatins, and that's what they called their leader. He had gained control, this, in, uh, this Indian chief, over 30 tribes. And he thought, okay, great, I can expand my power base because these, these English people, they've got guns and things, and therefore, if I can please them, I can gain even greater land and control a bigger kingdom. He realized too late that the English weren't there to, to become allies. They were there to subjugate the natives. Uh, that's what they were there to do. Now, one of the leaders of the colonists was Captain John Smith. Now, John Smith looks nothing like Pocahontas, uh, the Disney cartoon. He's got this big beard. He's a swashbuckler. Uh, he's an adventurer. He had been in a Turkish prison. He'd been all over the world for the most part. Uh, and it was his, his efforts that Jamestown survives. He spends a lot of times mapping the region, uh, the Chesapeake region. He, he, he tries to, to investigate the rumors of a blonde haired tribe this so-called lost colony there. Maybe these people from Roanoke are up here. Uh, he doesn't find them. Now he is captured by Powhatan, um, and he and two of his colleagues, his colleagues were skinned to death by uh, using oyster shells, taking off their skin. And according to John Smith in his diaries, uh, the only reason that stopped them from skinning him was that he showed them his compass, and they were amazed by this compass that he had. Uh, and that, that, that saved him for the moment. Now, oddly enough, and I, I mentioned this this morning too, at breakfast when I was talking, was that uh, they believe they found John Smith's compass in, in some of this uh, excavation, because a compass would have been a, a rare thing to have. Uh, it had Venice on it. John Smith had been in Venice, and they knew he had a compass. So they may have actually discovered his compass uh, almost 400 years after he, had, he was gone. Now, so he, 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 he's captured by these natives, and according to John Smith, uh, he's taken in front of the chief, and he's going to be executed when the chief's daughter, Pocahontas, jumps in front and says, don't kill him, he's, I love him, and blah, blah, blah. You've heard that story. Uh, now, this is in his diary. The problem with his diary is, is that he told that ex almost exact same story when he escaped from a Turkish prison. Uh, that that somebody jumped in front, uh, this princess jumped in front and saved his life. And he had no contemporary accounts of Pocahontas, not until later did he mention her. So again, when we look at John Smith, he's an adventurer, he's a swashbuckler, but he's also a big self-promoter and he's gonna make himself look bigger than he really is, uh, if that makes sense. So, um, let me get back to where I was, that's a side story. So, uh, the colony's on the verge of starvation. Uh, they have, uh, the, the natives aren't gonna trade with them anymore. And so he tells everybody, look, uh, if you don't eat, I mean, if you don't work, you will not eat. And for a lot of these people, they weren't wanting to work. Uh, they thought, no, I don't work, I am a noble. I'm here to sort of supervise. Uh, I'm not here to actually get my hands dirty. Uh, and I know there's probably some snarky comments about that out there, but it's true. And so uh, it's through his efforts that Jamestown survives. But in 1609, uh, Smith has to return to England. He had suffered powder burns. Some had argued this was during a, a, an Indian attack. Others had argued that it was an assassination attempt against John Smith because he was hated. But as soon as he leaves, anarchy ensues. Uh, they had almost 400 colonists at the time, but then famine hits. And this is called the starving time. And I have a primary source document up about it where you can read about the starving time in 1610, uh, 1609 and 1610. Uh, 
in May of 1610, a relief party finds, finds them and only 60 people are left alive. They've lost so many people. Jamestown almost wiped out. Uh, they ate all the poultry, they all ate all the livestock, uh, they ate their horses, uh, they ate their dogs, uh, and, and a few people, and, and they've actually uh, dug up bodies, uh, they have found that they turned to cannibalism. One man supposedly murdered his wife uh, and then uh, ate her. And then apparently he was tried and executed. I don't know if they ate him either, but anyway. But there was cannibalism, not surprising. And so for the, about the next seven years, that, that colony uh, limps along. Uh, it doesn't do much. It's, it's on the verge of uh, falling apart. Uh, but what t changes this colony around is in 1612, John Rolfe introduces a new crop, and that new crop is tobacco. Uh, and by 1615, they are exporting tobacco. Now there's a money maker for them. Um, and we're gonna see that really take off. Smoking will become the rage of Europe. Uh, now he will then marry uh, Pocahontas, uh, which will bring peace among the native tribes. He takes her to London in 1620, which, not a good idea because London is one big cesspool of disease uh, and she dies a horrible death in 1620 of smallpox. And so, uh, as you can imagine, they probably didn't put that in the Disney cartoon, I'm gonna guess. So that brings us uh, to 1618. And again, this course is not gonna be date heavy. I'm just trying to give you an idea of when this is occurring, but they will start what we call the head right policy. Now the Henright policy said that, look, if you could get yourself over to the new world, you got 50 acres of land. And for every servant that you could pay over, you got an additional 50 acres of land. Wow. Um, that's amazing uh, to get 50 acres of land. Because if you go back to Europe, to England, for example, you couldn't get land. Land was all taken up by the nobles. Uh, and that land had primarily been deforested. Um, and so here was a chance for people to get a fresh start. Uh, this is an economic reason. This is why people are running to move. This isn't about religion or anything like this. At, at this point, it's about, I, I can really better myself by going to this new world. And of course, they oversold a lot of this. They said that there was just food everywhere. And it was a land of milk and honey. Uh, and when they got here, and they found these dense forests. They're not like we are today where they thought nature was just wonderful. They saw that as very, a very forbidding place. So that brings us to 1619. And this is an important year. This is maybe one of the more important years in American history. And that's why you have that 1619 project. Uh, because three important things happened in 1619. Uh, number one, the first Virginia General Assembly meets. It's the first time that we end up having representative government uh, in the North American colonies, that these people are going to elect people to represent them in a general assembly. Now, that's important because we're talking at 1619. That means that uh, when we get around to the American Revolution and London is trying to gain tighter control over the colonies in the 1760s and 1770s, that means that, that Americans had been used to governing themselves for almost 140 years. And so for the English to say, now we're gonna change that was difficult because we'd had a long tradition of this beginning in 1619 with the first General Assembly. Now also in 1619, this was important to happen. Very important. 90 young maidens arrive because what we know is that the colonies need women because you cannot have a colony growing unless people are getting pregnant and having kids. And so there was a shortage of women in the colonies, and now you've got 90 young women coming over here, and they would be sold to the husband of their choice. Um, um, it, uh, yeah, probably true. Um, so they would pick their husband, they'd probably sit there and go, okay, which one of you has teeth? Uh, and then the husband would have to pay uh, 
the cost of their transportation, which was roughly you would pay for a wife 125 pounds of tobacco. That's what you'd pay for a wife. Uh, and then the job was your wife was supposed to start having babies um, as fast as possible. Now, if your husband died, your job wasn't to sit around and go, oh, boo-hoo, my husband's died. Your job was to remarry and start having kids again uh, so the colony could grow. And as you well know, uh, you might have nine or 10 kids and maybe only two of them make it past 12 years old. And so probably a good thing would be never name your kids, just you know, give them numbers. But that was a tough time. You expected a lot of them to die. And so having these women over, and we're gonna see a shortage of women in the colonies for a long time, which is gonna to lead to a lot of adultery, but also laws that make it easier for women to divorce and greater protection of women against uh, domestic abuse. <coughs> And then last but not least here in 1619, and this is what the 1619 project is, is about uh, that we've seen in the New York Times, is that a Dutch man of war drops off the first Africans to an English colony. Now, what do we know about these first Africans? Well, more than likely that they were indentured servants, uh, not necessarily slaves, uh, that hadn't happened yet, uh, but indentured servants were those people that owed money. Somebody would pay your way over to the new world, and then you would have to work off that debt, uh, and then you would get your own land. And we know that some of these first Africans did get their own land, but this is gonna be the first beginnings of slavery eventually in the colonies. And that's why 1619 is, the 1619 project is named after that. But you can see these three major events in 1619. Well, in 1622, John Rolfe uh, is killed in an Indian attack. Uh, in fact, the entire colony almost gets wiped out again. And eventually the Virginia Company um, goes bankrupt. It will no longer be uh, a joint stock uh, colony where you would make investments. Uh, in 1624, Virginia becomes a royal colony. Now, a royal colony is obviously owned by the king. So that's gonna be another different type of colony. We have a joint stock where investors put that money in there, and then we have a royal colony which is owned by the king. Uh, and so Virginia moves along uh, as very slowly. Now, the next colony we wanna mention, and we're gonna get through Maryland here, uh, is Maryland. Now, Maryland is gonna be what we call a proprietary colony. Uh, this is not given to an individual. It's not owned by the king. I mean, I mean, it's, it's not a, let me rephrase that. It's not a stock company where you invest stocks. It's not owned by the king. It's given to one person. Often is a way of uh, granting um, some sort of reward or favor. In this case of this proprietary colony, it's going to be given to Sir George Calvert. Uh, he also has the name, the Lord Baltimore. Now, Calvert is a Catholic. And as you can imagine, being a Catholic in Protestant England was difficult. Uh, you could easily get burned at the stake, uh, executed. You were always seen with some suspicion. Um, and so he decided that, look, we need to find a new place for English Catholics. And so he said, look, uh, in 1625, he went to the king and said, I'd like to have a colony in the New World so we English Catholics could go live there in peace. So the king in 1632, it's going to be a different king, Charles I, uh, says, I will grant you this, this, this colony. Unfortunately for George Calvert, the Lord Baltimore, he had died a year earlier. But his son, the second Lord Baltimore, founds the colony at St. Mary's, located on a small stream near the mouth of the Potomac. And so this, this proprietary colony, the Lord Baltimore uh, had all the powers to govern with the consent of the property owners. Again, there's some government by consent going on in here. In 1635, they have the first legislature meet. It's also bicameral, two houses. That's a tradition we're gonna see going on. Um, originally, what they were going to try to do is they were gonna try to create uh, estates like you had back in uh, England, right? You'd have the huge manor estate and people would work your land and pay you rent. Uh, 
that didn't work. And the reason it doesn't work, we're gonna see this again in the Carolinas is, why would you go work somebody else's land when you could just leave and go start your own farm and not have to work for somebody? So eventually he says, all right, look, um, come over and you can get some land. We'll do a head right policy as well. Uh, and eventually they will also turn to tobacco. Now, this is an example, and, and the next one we're gonna see is an example as well, is that when we talk about uh, this is a misconception we see in American history. When we talk about um, uh, why people settle and they go for freedom of religion, no, they, they didn't settle for freedom of religion. They settled for the freedom of their religion. Uh, they weren't going to be tolerant of people who disagreed with them, which brings us um, to the New England area where we're best known for people settling on religious issues. Uh, and this is going to be the New England colonies, which we will refer to as Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, New Hampshire. Those are going to be, I don't say Maine, because Maine was considered part of Massachusetts. So when we start settling New England, we're going to first start off with the Pilgrims. They're going to uh, found this place called Plymouth. Uh, maybe you've seen Plymouth Rock. Now, Pilgrims are separatists. Um, those were those people, those, those uh, Protestants, who wanted to be separate from the Church, church of England. Uh, they wanted to be separate from uh, uh, the government of England. And they wanted to create a Christian commonwealth. They had um, been persecuted by James I because their new form of church government said, we don't believe that the king is in charge of the church. And so they had been persecuted. They had fled to Holland in 1607. But in Holland, they also faced discrimination. And they were afraid that their children were becoming too Dutch. I mean, they're wearing wooden shoes and wanting to plant tulips everywhere. Oh my gosh, next thing you know, it's gonna be clog dancing. And so they wanted to return back to England, but then they go, no, because we'll just get persecuted again. So they said, how about this, James? Why don't you let us establish a colony in the new world? Uh, we'll leave us alone, uh, you alone, you'll leave us alone, and probably we'll all die anyway. That should make you happy. And so <laughs> James says, all right, I'll give you some colony, uh, a colony in the new world. And again, these pilgrims don't mean that they're going to be, they don't want Catholics around them. They don't want other Protestants around them. They don't want Baptists around them. They don't want any of those people around them. They want freedom for their own religion, and that's it. They will persecute other people. So in September of 1620, led by William Bradford, 101 men, women, and children, and we all know this, uh, were aboard the Mayflower. Only about half were pilgrims. And by the way, this, these boats are very small boats, you know, maybe uh, uh, 30 yards long. Uh, you know, you did not shower, obviously. Uh, you're on a boat for six, six to seven weeks, right? Uh, it, it's, it's horrible. It's like going to a city council retreat. And so, um, they landed a place called Cape Cod. Now, you can imagine why it's called Cape Cod. Because there's lots of cod. And there's a, if I could just get about behind my green screen, there's a book, a great book on this called uh, Cod, the Fish That Changed the World. It was written by the guy who also wrote the book on salt and wrote a book on marijuana. And I can't remember his name after that, but uh, the cod will become central to the industry of the New England area. Uh, there is some talk that maybe some, um, uh, some people from Spain had actually visited this area earlier as they said that the cod was so easy to find. Uh, the cod is so important that if you go to Boston today and you go into the, in the legislative branch, they have an old wooden cod above the speaker's chair, which when they built the new assembly building uh, over 150 years ago, they took the cod from the old one and they marched through the streets all carrying the cod in the air, chewing the cod and it's put back up there. And so uh, cod fishing, so very important. Not as much anymore because they've overfished it. Uh, on November 21st, 1620, 41 pilgrims create the Mayflower Compact, just the men. And what it was, it's again, this idea that, okay, we're gonna create laws, but we're gonna choose our own leaders. The king's not gonna choose them. And we'll agree to follow those laws that our leaders create. That's that idea of government by consent. Again, 1620, right, right around 1619 as well, Americans are getting used to the idea of governing themselves and this idea of, of, of an independent spirit that we still see today. Now, 
Of course, they didn't plan very well, as you can imagine, um, because one, they got a late start, and they they arrive, uh, you know, in September in New England. Well, you could imagine what's going to happen. Uh, the winter's going to hit, and half these people die that first winter. Now, in the spring of 1521, they meet Squanto, who's a, uh, a friendly native who shows them how to grow maize, uh, what we would call corn, uh, which is a, a new world food. Don't get that confused that, uh, as you know, that if you go back and study Roman history, the Romans talk about the corn laws. Corn in Europe is any grain. We refer to corn in the United States as maize, right? So it's a little bit confusing. But he shows them how to grow maize and this saves the colony. <clears throat> and every year they'll have a, a feast that they'll call Thanksgiving. Um, it's one of many different Thanksgivings. So I think that's the original one. Well, again, let's take a moment and back up and talk about how we rephrase that. All right. So we say that they meet Squanto, who's a friendly Indian. Well, that's our perspective, right? If you're a Native American, what do you think about Squanto? You might think that guy's a traitor. Right? He's helping these invaders get a foothold and survive, <coughs> which is going to lead to the end of our, our way of life. And so that's a different perspective. Now, the next group, and this is the last group we're going to talk about uh, uh, tonight, is going to be the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, these people are Congregationalists. Um, or what you would also refer to as Puritans today. Now, Puritans, they wanted to purify the Anglican church. They felt that, hang on a second, I get this itchy throat. They felt that, uh, that the, the, the English church still had so much uh, papal influences. Uh, they didn't like all of the music, they didn't like any of the symbols, they really felt that churches should be self-governing and a church, they would be offended by most churches today. <coughs> uh, yes, Lori, probably even yours uh, because of stained glass windows and play music. They wanted uh, churches that were just pretty much blocks, right? Uh, and benches, right? Uh, nothing else. And then they wanted the church membership limited to what they called visible saints. Those are the people that they knew that were, that, it, that they knew were saved already, because these Puritans were often Calvinists. And if you know John Calvin, and I, I know you all do, Calvin had this idea of predestination, that that God um, had already chosen who was going to be saved and not saved. Uh, and so, visible saints were those people that, that they had to meet certain criteria of to prove that they were saved. And there's a, an artist, uh, not an artist, uh, uh, an author named John Demos who wrote this book called The Puritan Dilemma. And this Puritan Dilemma says that, you know, you're a Puritan, right? And you want to think that you're the saved. So how could you tell? Well, you were a moral person. You went to church. You were successful at business. You know, these were blessings of God. You know, your farm was successful. But what happens if lightning hits your house and burns it down? Then your neighbors start thinking, hmm. Maybe he's not one of those people that have been gifted by God's grace. And you yourself start thinking, okay, what did I do wrong? Why is God punishing me? Or if your child died, or you're, uh, you're, you're, you lost your crop. And so for Puritans, they live in this real dilemma of whether they're saved or not. And it's that sort of thing of when bad things happen to good people, you wonder, is God mad at me? And they constantly worry about that. So the Puritans were not uh, real popular in England. They were persecuted. And so they went to Charles I after James I died and said, can we have some new land? And we're this, 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 this new company is going to be the Massachusetts Bay Company. And we're going to go off there and we're going to start our own little uh, affair. And we won't bother you anymore. You don't bother us anymore. And the king says, sure, why not? And of course, these Puritans are not going to be people that are going to uh, be religiously tolerant either. Uh, they, uh, I've got some documents on my primary source page about them hanging Quakers. As you know, Quakers are, uh, uh, yeah, Lutherans solved that problem. It's funny. Uh, Quakers are um, 
you know, they're nonviolent, but uh, Puritans didn't like them and they will hang them uh, in Boston Commons. So you can go to Boston Commons and uh, see where they were hanging uh, uh, Quakers. Well, these people are led by John Winthrop, and this may sound like a contradiction in terms. He's a respected lawyer. I know that sounds strange that those things actually exist, but they did. And he's going to use this colony as a haven for persecuted Puritans. So being a lawyer, what does a lawyer do? He finds a loophole in the charter. Whenever you were going to start a, a colony, you had to have a charter. It was a contract from the king. And usually that charter had to stay in London so that the king could change it whenever he wanted to. But he noticed, went through this loophole. Now, by the way, a loophole is actually uh, its original origin. It comes from a castle where you could shoot arrows out of it. Um, but he notices that it's not there. That little, that little section is not there. So he goes, yoink, I'm taking this charter to Massachusetts. So that way maybe the Puritans will have control because the king cannot tell us what to do. So in March of 1630, they, they take a ship to the New World, and Winthrop has his flock there, right? His followers, his flock. He tells them to get the flock off the ship. That's funny, it's not what you think it says. And he gives maybe the most famous speech uh, in American history in terms of its impact, where he says, look, we are going to be, and it's a quoting from the Bible, uh, a city upon a hill a shining beacon to the worst rest of the world. In other words, he was saying that America was going to show the world how you do this right, how you become a moral society and a self-governing society. We were going to be that shining example. And, and if you remember, and a lot of you old enough remember George Bush Sr. Uh, instituting his thousand points of light, that's referring to this speech. Lincoln refers to it. Reagan refers to it. Um, Obama refers to, they all refer to this speech. Uh, now, again, does America live up to that throughout its history? No, but it posits the idea as a standard that needs to be reached. Uh, they fall short in a lot of cases, but it's a standard where they, they feel like we've got to try that. So by the end of 1630, they've had 17 ships arrive and a thousand colonists, invaders, whatever you want to call them, and they get a new capital called Boston. And this begins what they call the Great Migration. It's one of many great migrations we'll, we'll talk about in American history, uh, in which uh, between 1630 and 1640, 40 to 50,000 Englishmen will flee to the New World. Uh, a lot of them convicts, they'll probably settle in the Washington DC area. So political joke there for you. Um, but it really starts boosting uh, the Massachusetts area. The Massachusetts in 1644 will develop a bicameral legislator, uh, legislature uh, elected by the voters. Uh, that would be white male property owners. Uh, sorry, Lori. Uh, voters used to be only church members, but then they said, no, you've got to be a property owner. So not everything's great in Massachusetts, right? Uh, like I said, they're hanging Quakers. They're persecuting people. Um, and then they have their own dissenters. They have one guy by the name of Roger Williams. And Roger Williams didn't want to purify the Church of England. He wanted a complete break. And he said, we should have no relations with the English government or the Anglican, Anglican Church. And he said that the church should not have relations with people that were unregenerate, that were not saved. He eventually came to believe that the only true church that was possible consisted of, consisted of himself and maybe his wife. Uh, and he's the guy that comes up with this idea of separation of church and state. Well, that doesn't play well with the Puritans because they saw church and state as one. Uh, he's brought before the court in Massachusetts. Uh, he's banished, said you have to go back to England, which is something that we'll talk a little bit later, probably in October. If you think about it, back in the day, somebody commits a crime, you can put them in the stocks, you can execute them, you can brand them, uh, or you banish them. There was no such thing as a penitentiary or a prison. That's what you did. You just banish them and they go to somebody else's town and cross province. Well, he doesn't want to go back to England. He escapes and he starts his own settlement uh, known as Rhode Island. And Rhode Island, uh, although somewhat troublemakers later on, will become uh, the first colony, uh, colony to legislate religious freedom for everybody. Uh, and that's going to be rare. Now, 
the other problem they're gonna have is with Anne Hutchinson. Uh, now she's a articulate, strong-willed, intelligent woman. Uh, she's the wife of a prominent merchant. She had raised 13 children. Like I said, your job was to have a whole bunch of children. And so after, after church, she would have sermons in her house. Yeah, and they would just talk about how great the minister was and all oh, they learned so much from this, this sermon. But then she started providing her own commentaries on the sermon, critiques, if you will. Then she claimed that she had a direct revelation from God, that God spoke to her directly. And God told her that only one or two Puritan preachers actually told the truth. Uh, and that good works, doing good could lead to salvation, which of course conflicts with the Puritan doctrine of predestination. And according to Puritan doctrine, only a minister could interpret the will of God. Worse yet, <coughs> she's a woman. And the last thing they wanted was a woman saying what was going on. So she's tried for heresy in 1637. She's banished from the area in 1638 as a woman, and I'm quoting here, not fit for society. Uh, she went to Provi uh, Providence and settled on the island near Portsmouth. <coughs> She was pregnant, strangely enough. Um, that was on Lutherans. Sorry, I just gave a text message. It's funny about Lutherans. Uh, she, she was pregnant, and the child is stillborn. And for critics, they said, well, there's your proof. Uh, God is, was, was angry with her, stillborn a child. In 1642, she then moved to Long Island, uh, where... Uh, in 1643, she and five of her children are massacred. Now, when news of this hit John Winthrop, Winthrop said, you see, divine justice. God got his way. So Winthrop's an interesting guy. Uh, he's a typical Puritan in terms of being, uh, you know, uh, doctrinaire, uh, little tolerance for anyone else. Uh, you can actually see Winthrop's grave uh, which he would probably hate where it's at. It's, it's at the first, right next to the first Anglican church uh, built in Boston, right across from the uh, Parker House Hotel. And uh, his grave is right next to a, a subway vent. So you can go see his grave. So um, we've established some of these colonies. Now, what we're going to do next time is Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, the Carolinas, we'll talk about New York, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania to Delaware, and last but not Georgia. We'll establish all these colonies and the reason they come into it. And then we'll start really getting into um, what made the Southern colonies and the New England colonies and the middle colonies different in terms of economics, society, uh, religion. It's a, it's a, real, uh, a real dividing point in, in uh, the United States, what will be soon be the United States again. Okay, so um, I'll stop there. That was a good long hour, I, I think. Uh, and if you have any questions, ask away, comments, um, um, anything surprising. Uh, you know, I, again, I, I know ARB has, has taught some of these history courses, so he's familiar with it. Um, and I know the Gloviers are very, and I know Laurie runs the history thing. But that's pretty much, you know, I wish I could stand around and walk and be able to talk, but I can't. I have to sit here. So uh, I'm going to record. I've recorded this, and I will post it. I'm going to stop recording it right now.